Welcome back to another episode of Tell Me Another, a programme dedicated to telling great stories from the past. Stories of genius and folly, compassion and cruelty. But instead of sitting around a campfire telling stories of our ancestors, we're coming to you from the History Department of the United States Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. We're coming with stories to tell, and we hope you will listen. Today, we're continuing our story of carving out empire, partition and the end of empire in India. And as in the first episode, with us in the studio today are three associate professors at the Naval Academy, Thomas Burgess, Hayden Bellinoy and Matthew Janique. Please Hayden, take us away for part two. By the autumn of 1945, with the war finished in Europe and Asia, Britain had clearly won. But in India, the British Raj was at its knees. For while the war was raging in Asia and Europe, important and crucial developments were taking place politically within the Congress Party and the Muslim League. If we recall, the Congress Party was very confrontational with the colonial state during the Second World War. But the Muslim League largely abstained from such confrontation and spent the war convincing Indian Muslims that if they did not vote for the Muslim League in upcoming provincial elections, they would be acting, quote, against Islam and they would be subject to what they called a Hindu Raj. As one voter stated in a newspaper, quote, if we did not vote for the League, we would have become an infidel. And Jinnah and the Muslim League were playing with the fires of religious politics and passion. One of the first major meetings in this run-up to partition was the Simla Conference in June 1945. It attempted to build upon the 1942 Stafford Cripps mission to India, which basically envisioned a devolution of power and a looser federation of Indian states. And this was an arrangement which gave provinces, but not religious communities, the right to join a new Indian Union free of British rule. So at first, things looked good and promising. The British Viceroy Lord Wavell proposed an executive council composed entirely of Indians, which would include representatives of low caste Hindus and untouchables and Indian Muslims. The plan also called for elections for a central assembly that would manage the defense, taxation, and foreign relations. But this was when the Muslim League cashed in on the credit it had earned during the wartime. Jinnah insisted very stubbornly that the Congress party could not speak for Muslims and that he alone was their sole spokesman. It is fair to say that the British largely let Jinnah wreck the talks because he gave the British a bargaining chip with the Congress party. They could say, hey, look, you Congress party, you claim to speak for all of India, but this major party here says you don't and you can't just dismiss them. Remember, the British were concerned with minimizing the loss of their assets and interests on their way out of India. Also, the provincial elections of 1945 and 1946 returned considerable majorities for the Congress, particularly in provinces where Muslims were only a small minority. But the Congress party lost in provinces where Muslims were a majority, namely Bengal, Sindh, and the Punjab. The Muslim League also won 80% of all the reserved seats in the Central Assembly for Indian Muslims, which somewhat affirmed Jinnah's claim to be the sole spokesman for India's Muslims. The other major gap between the Muslim League and the Congress Party lay in the future they saw for India. Congress saw itself as the rightful inheritor of the very centralized colonial state that the British had built up over two centuries. They looked to the history of the decentered Mughal Empire of the 18th century as a precondition for foreign exploitation and conquest. But the Muslim League envisioned a more loosely federated union with strong states' rights. To Jinnah and the Muslim League, this was the only thing that could protect the political rights of Indian Muslims in provinces such as Punjab, Bengal, and Sindh. Otherwise, in a centralized nation state, Indian Muslims feared that they would be subjected to what they feared, the tyranny of the majority of a largely Hindu population. So to achieve their objectives, on 16 August 1946, Jinnah and the Muslim League launched Direct Action Day. They appealed to Indian Muslims across the country to take action into their own hands and onto the streets to make their voices heard. But in doing so, Jinnah was playing with the fire of religiously fueled politics, and he offered a preview of what would happen just shy of a year later. Roughly 3,000 Hindus and Muslims died within four days. We now know that the riots were launched with complicity of Muslims in the police force and the army. The Indian Muslim chief minister of Bengal, Hussein Sohrawardi, assured Jinnah and the Muslim League that there would be no interference from the police. 
The violence then spread into the Bengal countryside. Poor Muslim tenants rose against their Hindu landlords in an exchange of violence and revenge killings. In the province of Bihar, upcountry from Bengal, at least 8,000 were killed within three weeks. The passions of religious politics also spread to western Punjab, where 5,000 Hindu and Sikh merchants were massacred. This in turn fueled retaliatory killings, and hundreds of thousands of Hindus and Sikhs began a mass migration eastwards. Conversely, hundreds of thousands of Muslims in the eastern Punjab started to move westward. So it's fair to say that by late summer 1946, violence and mass migration already preceded the vivisection of India into the two separate nation states of India and Pakistan. You can see things starting to unravel and fragment. I would wonder, where did this religious identity and communalism come from? Obviously, in the 21st century, we're, we tend to see things, you know, in, in a kind of clash of civilizational terms. But what's the complex history of, of religious relations in India and Pakistan? I think that's a very uh, timely and appropriate question. It's also a really good platform to lay to rest the fallacy of the idea of a clash of civilizations. Um, communalism in India, the, the idea of religious conflict between different communities in India, has a very complicated and, and longer history. For one, it does not boil down to religious difference. It does not boil down to theological differences. Because if that was the case, this would have happened much longer ago ago in history. What it comes from is, the, is the, the, the formation of the colonial state in India and how the colonial state utilizes demographic and religious statistics and knowledge to underscore their authority. So one example is the All India Census. The first one is published in 1870, 1871. And what that does is because it's official government document and the census is done uh, every three decades at an All India level, what this basically does is that it kind of lays out the demographics. This is where Hindus are a majority, at least those who recorded as Hindus. Uh, those who are Muslims are a minority here and a majority here. And that shapes how the distribution of patronage, of public office, and then increasingly the emergence of provincial politics, where Indians at the provincial level can get involved in politics, form uh, you know, factions in municipalities. Religious demographics then start to acquire the look and flavor of religious conflict. Um, and so I think that's one thing where it comes from. Another thing that comes from it as well does come from the Indian National Congress Party and their side. Because one of the ways they recruit so well and mobilize after the 1920s, you know, if you think about it, they want to recruit deep into the countryside to mobilize the agrarian masses, the peasants, right? They do this by appealing to very traditional Hindu religious symbolism. And what this does, when this gets mobilized on a mass scale, this makes Indian Muslim communities, who actually have no problem with Hindus or religious traditions and processions and holidays and festivals, they often participate in them themselves. But it seems like a more forceful assertion of a majoritarian Raj, basically. And so it's not about theology, it's about the proper, you know, in a way, kind of the, like the proper shape and scope that religious communities should have when it comes to doing government and politics. And so what you start to see by 1945 is this provincial question amplified at a national level. So I think that's a good way to address that question. I guess my question is about the role of Jinnah in all of this. I mean, some portray him as a separatist who, from beginning to end, always wanted his own separate state for uh, the... Uh, Muslim Indians of the subcontinent. But you're saying something a little bit different here. You're saying that he was a federalist who wanted guaranteed uh, freedoms and protections for India's Muslim minority within a loosely federated sort of Indian Union, uh, which would somehow protect Muslims from Hindu domination. Is that, but you seem to fall on definitely on one side of this debate. Yes, I think that's a good point. Um, Jinnah is not a separatist from the very beginning. I think some of us might think that because of the outcome of this whole process, but also that's a result of the historiography and the histories being written in India and Pakistan after 1947 that has 
kind of cal- you know, circulated the myth that he was a clear like visionary idealist and by extension separatist from the very beginning. Hindu nationalist parties in India would obviously like this story and the national narrative in Pakistani history would also like this story. As good historians, we know the reality is always much more complicated. And what we see with Jinnah is that you know, he's really trying to bargain. And what we're going to get to shortly is that he makes a bad bargain. He doesn't fully understand the strength of his hand and the strength of the hands, the cards of the other parties at the table, I think. Um, so he's not a separatist. He's lo- I-, I would actually call him an accidental head of state to some degree. I think so. This brings us to the final acts in the swan song of the British Raj. By August 1946, there were several main factors that informed the British decision to leave India, or what we could comically be termed Britain's first Brexit. At the simple level of cost-benefit analysis, Britain had been so devastated by two world wars that it wasn't simply gaining anything from India. Second, there was what we would call imperial fatigue. Many British officers and the whole civilian bureaucratic apparatus of the colonial state were simply tired of the continual cycles of repression that occurred in India since the 1920s. Plus, as mentioned earlier, you know, a newer generation of less elite British civil servants, those who didn't go to Oxford and Cambridge, were becoming a larger portion of the Indian civil service. And they actually were far more sympathetic to Indian demands for independence than their more uh, crusty social superiors. And finally, the reality was that the British colonial state, in spite of its centralizing bureaucracy and regulatory permanence, simply lacked the ability to contain the violence and maintain law and order. Going back to Britain, also, a new Labour Party government was back in power. Prime Minister Clement Attlee was determined to get out of India and focus instead on domestic reconstruction. He announced that Britain would leave India by 30 June 1948, and the government sent Lord Mountbatten, the great-grandson of Queen Victoria, as the last terminal viceroy of India with a mandate to end over two centuries of British rule in the subcontinent. Mountbatten was indeed unusual as a viceroy, for he had a celebrity heir, and he got on very well with Gandhi, Jinnah, and Nehru. And he was also unusual because he knew the end of British rule was a certainty. The Muslim League and the Congress Party, fully aware of how the British for centuries had practiced the art of divide and conquer, undertook some last-minute attempts to bury their differences. For example, the regional parties that ruled Bengal province pledged to keep Bengal united. The same went for the Punjab, with the Punjab Unionist Party pledging to keep Punjab undivided. But these were desperate attempts for the inescapable realities of demographic politics, fueled by religious passions and exploited by political leaders, almost inevitably drove the train towards partition station. Jinnah and Gandhi accepted plans to keep Bengal and the Punjab united. This is very crucial. But we know that the Congress Party leadership, namely Nehru and Patel, outright rejected it. They wanted to preserve the centralized power of whatever state they inherited, and accepting federalism and regional autonomy would undermine that. This is when the British started to move things up quickly. They presented a partition plan to the Muslim League and the Congress on 2nd June 1947. It was ominously dubbed Plan Balkan in commentaries and drafts before it was handed over. And it was effectively a template to partition British India into two separate nation states, an independent India and an independent Pakistan. For the British, this solved the major problem of religious communal violence in debates over centralization versus states' rights. And this is where we know Mountbatten and the British Raj pulled their weight. They pressed Jinnah to accept the plan, but we know that Jinnah actually wanted to reject it. And the exchange between Mountbatten and Jinnah went like this. But, Mr. Jinnah, you will lose Pakistan. What must be, must be, Jinnah replied. Mountbatten said in response, Mr. Jinnah, I do not intend to let you wreck all the work that has gone into this settlement. Since you will not accept for the Muslim League, I will speak for them myself. The next day, on 3 June 1947, Jinnah was ordered to, quote, nod his head in acceptance. This was a terrifying and brute reminder that the British still commanded immense weight just two months before the end of colonial rule. Now this was crushing for Jinnah. He envisioned a more loosely federated Indian Union with a vague Pakistan region within it. In fact, he rejected the shape of the Pakistan the British offered. 
Jinnah called it a, quote, truncated or mutilated moth-eaten Pakistan. But the British and the Congress Party didn't care what Jinnah wanted. They cared about getting out and solving pressing political matters. They could not agree to Jinnah's political vision. The British, for their part, wanted to wash their hands and solve political, religious, communal violence problems expediently, while the Congress Party wanted to inherit an independent state with all the centralized powers the British had built up over two centuries. Nehru and Patel, being good historians and historical thinkers, feared that a decentralized independent state simply wouldn't survive, particularly in the context of the geopolitical rivalries of the Cold War. Survival meant a painful trade-off for the future of India, lumping off large parts of its western and eastern wings that were historically within the cultural and civilizational orbit of India. The Congress party grudgingly voted in favor of partition, with the famous photograph of Nehru raising his arm in resignation to the brute reality of realpolitik. And then, almost out of nowhere, the British and Mountbatten sped up the departure date by one year, which was not exactly a lot of time for planning and drawing up boundaries. Independence was eventually granted at midnight, 15 August 1947. Just under 200 years of British colonial rule came to an end. The Union Jacks were lowered in the new capitals of New Delhi, India, and Karachi, Pakistan. They were replaced with the Indian tricolor of orange, white, and green, and Pakistan's green crescent moon flag. Nehru gave a very eloquent and moving speech. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny, and now when the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. And freedom came, but it also came at significant cost. The drawing up of national boundaries in regions that had historically not known them. Arbitrary divisions between Muslims and Hindus who had lived side by side for centuries. The mass mobilization of religious passions, combined with demographic politics, led to chronic mistrust that culminated in August 1947. Historians estimate that some 10 to 20 million Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs packed up camp and relocated to new sovereign nation states that they now called home. Some 500,000 to more than 3 million are estimated to have died in the dislocations of migration and violence. It was arguably one of, if not the, largest migration in human history, unprecedented in scale, scope, and rapidity. The partition of India is undoubtedly one of the more underappreciated human rights tragedies of the mid-20th century. Hayden, when we contemplate all of this human suffering on such a vast scale, I guess the question that comes to mind most immediately is, was all this avoidable or was it inevitable? That is a very good question, and I think as historians and scholars, we sometimes like to indulge in these questions and ask ourselves. Um, I think it's important to ask that question, not because we're concerned with trying to find veritable truth or fact, but I think it's important to take, forces us to take a broader look at the longer history of India and what happens under the colonial uh, period of British rule. On the one hand, partition, if you are focusing on the realities of nation states and the global order that gets built up by Western Europeans and North Americans by the 1940s, then it is inevitable because when you create the categories of nation states and particularly ones that have uh, a certain sort of demographic sort of defining characteristic to them, in the case of India being overwhelmingly though not exclusively, for uh, want of a better term, a broadly Hindu country and culture, right? That's easy to square with theories of nationalism based on language, race, ethnicity, culture, values, etc. Same goes for Pakistan on the other side, basically. And so I think when it comes to that and it comes to the, one of the realities of modern nation states, which is the employment and the inevitable engagement with demographic politics, then I think, yes, in a way, partition was inevitable. Um, if one considers additionally the realities of the second, First and Second World Wars, I think in the long term it does make these things look inevitable. But I would also throw a bit of caution because hindsight often makes everything look inevitable. Because I think once you dig a bit deeper into the religious and the cultural and the social knowledge and histories of the, of the countries and the cultures we study, things get much more blurry and gray, I think. Um, because when you look at the reasons Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs 
are migrating. If you look at the reasons for religious and communal violence during bef both before, during, and the two years after the partition, you don't see debates over theology. You don't see debates that are doctrinal. You don't see things, you don't see the resignations of, oh, well, we're finally, for example, realized that we're surrounded by a bunch of idol worshipers, for example, so we're going to head off to the Western Punjab. I mean, you don't see anything like that. It's, it, what you see the anger about is being forced to be dislocated with no say in the matter. And, 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 and you actually, we now have scholarship that shows and has demonstrated that it was very common actually in localities where you know the local horizon being the most important for all of these people involved in here, not the higher ups, but people on the ground, right? That, you know, if they had to had to leave Lahore because they were Hindu, right? You know, they would or Sikh, they would have Muslim neighbors and friends who would hide them or take their stuff and then ship it to them later once they made it safely their safe passage across the border. So I think when you get like closer into the religious, the local histories, you see a far more complicated story, I think, and it's something that kind of runs counter to the kind of seductive appeal of, you know, historical hindsight that all things are inevitable. I, I don't think on that question, on that point, when you look at the local horizon and aperture, that the partition of India was necessarily inevitable. I also wonder, Hayden, is it really strikes me that if the partition of India and Pakistan are kind of is kind of rooted in context and 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 not rooted in uh, religious conflict and inevitability, is it fair to say that these nations are products of a colonial environment and to a certain extent are still products of a colonial environment? Can you make the argument that? the legacies of colonial rule uh, do still have a, 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 an important role to play in the late 20th, even early 21st century. I think it's a really good insight and something really worthy of discussion because I think it raises the very interesting question as to, you know, the questions of sovereignty and independence after it is formally granted, right? So I think in the, in, in, on the one hand, you could actually say that India and Pakistan, the nation states as we know them today, in terms of their structure, their administration to varying degrees, their legal codes, are very much products of the colonial encounter and of colonial rule. However, having said that, I think it's fair to say that India as a country would actually be less of a product of colonialism because India has a longer history that goes back thousands of years, basically. Whereas the idea of Pakistani history is a much more contested and very problematic concept. You know, I remember once I was talking with colleagues in Pakistan, they invited me for a conference, and the, the debate of the, the theme of the conference was debating narratives in Pakistani history. And I joked to them, this is going to be the most like amusing thing we're ever going to like encounter at a conference, because what's the debate, basically? Because in Pakistan, in independent Pakistan, the narrative, the historical narrative is, is, is very set. You know, Pakistan was mythically founded by Muhammad bin Qasim in the 8th century, an invasion of Sindh, for example, that the Mughals were really pre-proto uh, forthcoming versions of like Jinnah and well, who they called the Qaid Azam, you know, the great leader. So I, I think, you know, I think in that sense, Pakistan has a lot more work to do in terms of being less of a product of that colonial encounter. Um, but having said that, I think both states are, to some degree, they're products of the colonial counter when you look at the day-to-day -day administration, particularly one of my areas of focus, which is legal history. I mean, if you look at the Indian Penal Code and you read all 500-odd sections of it, you wouldn't want to live in the country because you would be worried that you would be booked for nearly anything. And when I started to do more research into the origins of the Penal Code and actually read, for example, the section on sedition, or my favorite section that I came across recently was, I think it was section 203 or 201, that the British criminalized abortion in India. Uh, I mean, and, and it's still on the books today. When you read that penal code, you see a mentality of government which is not about accountability. It's about managing and maintaining stability. And both India and Pakistan share that penal code. In Pakistan, though, it has become... Uh, what we'd call Islamized because of the adding of uh, blasphemy as a capital offense. 
in the 1980s under General Zia al haq for example. It just takes the old colonial language and then turns it into a capital offense, offending religious sensibility and, by extension, the prophet, may peace be upon him, da-da-da-da. You know, and so I, I think when you look a bit closer like that, they are products of the colonial encounter. But when you look at other aspects, such as the vibrant emergence of civil society, like one thing that strikes you about India and Pakistan is just how vibrant, if not sometimes chaotically vibrant, their civil societies are. Public debate and discourse, holding leaders to account, um, debating social norms and virtues, these things are intensely debated in India and Pakistan. That is very different from under the colonial period, where all that debate had to be sort of channeled or if not constrained, because when you get into a bit deeper into that colonial administration, you look at the censorship power tools that the colonial state had were utterly remarkable and very frightening, actually. So I think in that sense, like, the, 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 civ the, civ the civil sphere, you know, public debate, they really moved beyond that, I think, shedding that colonial legacy. And also economically as well, I would say, particularly India, you know, since the 19... Well, actually, they start kind of shed it immediately after, you know, 1950 in a way by really the autarkic sort of socialist model of Nehru that doesn't quite cut India off from the world, but makes it very hard to do business. That was very different from the colonial period where capital had free reign. Um, but I think India has undergone, undergone another transformation after the early 1990s with uh, what economists have called the liberalization of the Indian economy, the opening up to global capital markets. That's actually only continued in more intensity since in 2014, actually. Yeah, and there's, I mean, that's that's fascinating. There's always as well the the risk of reifying colonial power by suggesting that it has longevity, um, when in actual fact, a colonial state for all its power and for all its influence, there was an awful lot within Indian and and ultimately Pakistani society that was not controlled by the colonial state, and therefore it's not surprising that once those colonial fetters are, are, are removed, that that civil society is is able to blossom again. So that's it's absolutely fascinating. The point about uh, the penal code is is fascinating as well because obviously there have been some recent discussions within India about the legacies of these penal codes. And of course, like I'm thinking of uh, the Supreme Court decisions on, on uh, you know, kind of caste regiments within the army um, and then debates over, you know, homosexuality. Um, it, it's, it's fascinating how these quite dated British laws become touch points for, for, for modern civil discourse. I think you're right. They come almost like the barometer for debate and discussion is to decide whether someone is, you know, a reformist, more liberal, more traditional or orthodox, for example. But yeah, once you get into all of that stuff, um, particularly when it comes to the legal administration of India and Pakistan, I think you get a much more nuanced and complex understanding of, you know, the longevity of colonialism. I, I think that's very clear. Um, but to underscore the civil society point, the vibrancy of civil society, um, I mean, even then, this is very recent, in the past few months, the Indian government has actually undertaken a study and a charge to reformulate the entire penal code to what it sees as getting rid of some of the vestiges of colonialism, even though this party and all their predecessing parties and ruling governments were happy to utilize those levers whenever they saw fit in the early 1970s, periodically here and there. So that will be a very painful discussion. That's going to be a very intense one, I think. But I think, if anything, it just really speaks to something that has always struck me about India and really impressed me every time I go there is the sheer vibrancy and energy in terms of debating politics, society, you know, people's role in certain, like, castes and men and women's role in society. That struck me as the, the one, like, a really amazing thing that stands out from all of this that I think kind of shines through all these structures of the legacies of colonialism. Thank you for tuning in to Tell Me Another. We hope you liked what you heard and want to join us again soon. From all of us at USNA History Productions, thank you and see you soon.